والصلاة والسلام على تمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد um, This night for me is a rather historical night For you it's just a regular lecture But for me, uh, this is the first time I've been back to the West in about uh, 15 years Ever since I left to seek knowledge in Sudan and Saudi Arabia So uh, it's a special night for, for me and a historical night and uh, I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first of all uh, for giving me this opportunity to visit my brothers uh, and spend this time with you and also thank the uh, brothers in the administration here uh, Sheikh Saeed and our brother uh, Hassan and other brothers here in the administration for having husn of dhun uh, for calling me all this way but you know, as they're about to find out I don't really have anything to offer just any I guess a new face but inshallah we'll try to do what we can do inshallah and also, I'd like to thank the uh, Canadian authorities for allowing me to enter the country after the VIP and the, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, as they were, and he, were at the plane waiting for me uh, very kindly and very nicely. And we had a nice long sit with them. But at the end, I have to say they were very nice and very polite. And I appreciate this. You know, I didn't, uh, I didn't know if I was going to come out after I sat there for all that time. But they were nice enough to let me come. And they were very polite with me during this ordeal. So I'd like to thank them for that. And لا يشكر الله من لا يشكر الناس. Even if they're non-Muslims, and we must thank them for, for being kind for me. And they could have been rather rude, but they were not. They were very kind during their ordeal. And here we are with you today. And also, and even though it's my, my first lecture here, I almost missed it. Because I fell asleep and I told the brothers it must be the Somalian food. You know, it's the first time I tried it. But they eat it with the banana and I, and I didn't. And I said, no, no, that's a little too far, you know. So I guess the banana is what levels it out, you know. Because I was knocked out, you know. And I still have the sleep in my eyes. So, <laughs> but, alhamdulillah, I made it here today. And I thought I was safe because the, the, the title is, Who Am I? So, you know, I wasn't really ready for the lecture when it woke me up right before it. So I said, I can just talk about myself, you know, and say, who am I? And, you know, who am I? But she excites, so that's going to be for tomorrow. So I have to talk about <laughs> The original lecture. Like, who can tell me, what do you, what do you understand from the title? Who am I? What, what do you want to talk about tonight? One of the, I can't really see you too well, so you have to make sure probably some in the front row is lights are mashallah. Uh, but who, uh, who can tell me what I mean by this title? Who am I? What are we going to talk about tonight? Yeah, well, I can't really see back. I saw a hand go up there. You know? Anybody, anybody. I don't want, I don't want a bunch of dead people sitting here in front of me. Somebody tell me what I mean by it. Who am I as a Muslim? And we'll talk about the Muslim identity. Uh, the Muslim identity. Who am I? This is what we want to talk about tonight. And, we, and this is a very important, you know, whether we live in the West or we live in the East, to be able to hold on to our Muslim identity. We're going to talk about some of the ways that will help us in doing that. And before that, we need to talk about uh, the importance of this topic. And the importance of this topic, we can see it what? When we see the focus of the enemies of Islam on trying to uh, take the Muslim far away from his religion or take him out of the fold of Islam altogether. And before we mention what's happening in the day we live in, if we look throughout Islamic history, uh, we see that this is something that the enemy of Islam started from an early age in Islam. If you look, for example, one of the first or the major fitna in Islam was started by a man by the name of Abdullah ibn Saba, who was a Yehudi who pretended to be a Muslim in order to corrupt Islam from the inside. And where did they get this idea from? When uh, they thought they had killed Isa alayhi uh, salam, and people started to call to you know, the true Christianity from his followers, from his Hawariyin, they sent who they know today as what? As Paul, as we hear as Paul or Paulus, as we say in Arabic. Uh, they sent him, who also was a Jew, to corrupt Christianity from the inside. And they were very successful in doing so. So they thought, since we're successful with these people, we'll do the same thing with the Muslims, with this guy, Abdullah ibn Saba. So they sent him, and but they didn't know, as it said in the Quran, inna nazalna dhikr, wa inna lahu lahafidun. Allah sent down the dhikr, but He promised that He would protect it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they didn't realize this. So they started a fitna. But alhamdulillah, Islam continued to grow, and it's still today, the true Islam is still uh, here today. But this is what, if you know the Rafidah, the Shia, this is where they come from, from this man, Abdullah ibn Saba, and a distorted version of Islam. 
Also, if you look throughout the history with uh, the different philosophies that came to the Islamic world, and it's different groups who came to corrupt Islam from the inside. And even today, we have uh, people who attack Islam in the name of Islam and different groups that come. Uh, and I don't want to go into all de detail about this, but I think a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Different groups who come with different ideologies and they corrupt Islam from the inside. However, one of the main things they focus on in trying to corrupt the Muslims today is what we call a ghazw al-fikri. It's a war of what ideology or something like that, I guess you would say, where they focus basically on two things. On the issue of shubuhat and shahwat. In the shubuhat, they want us to have doubt about our religion. And the shahwat, the lust and the desires of this dunya. So which one do they focus on more in the day we live in? Huh? Shahwat. And you may basically, it's more. But also the shubuhat... The types of doubt, they're, they're also they're, they're great in numbers. not a small amount. Don't think it is. They have a lot of these they focus on in different ways they do. Uh, they try to in, in, indirectly make the Muslims either leave their religion or what? Be weak in their religion. I'll give you an example. Uh, when the, when a, a, a large Christian meeting for, the, what, for those who are the, the missionaries, the Christian missionaries, they used to want to call uh, or, or, or to take the Muslims outside of the fold of Islam and call them to Christianity. They realized this wouldn't work, and I'll give you an example of something that happened in Indonesia. It's a, it's a funny story, but it's a true story. Because in a lot of the Muslims who, you know, who they say leave Islam for Christianity, it's because of what? They, what they're going to get in return for money. So these Indonesians, they went with the Christians, they started to learn, and they were very happy with their progress. So they said to them, we're going to give you a gift, anything you want. Just tell us what it is. So they went and they huddled up on the side, and they said, like, what do you want? So they come back, their leader... And they say, we want a free trip to Mecca. Uh, and this is after, they're supposed to be Christians, so they say, we want a free trip to Mecca, so they realized uh, it wasn't working. So they studied Islam. And now people, in the, and they say, oh, mashallah, all the major universities in the West, they have Islamic studies program. They have Islamic studies program, not because they love us, or they love Islam, because they want to know how to distort Islam, how to fight Islam. And they, uh, one of the things they learned is from Nawaqad al-Islam, the things that contradict or take us out of the fold of Islam is if we, don't, if we have shik, if we have any doubt in our religion. And that's why one of their priests said to them that it's enough for us, for the Muslims, to have him what? Doubt his religion. Just to have shik. And that, and, and that means that he will leave uh, the religion. And they want you to become a kafir just as they are a kafir so you can be equal to them. And also... When we look at the shahwat, the lusts and desires, and you living in Canada, we don't have to go really deep into that to see what I'm talking about. But they want to corrupt our Muslim societies by the same type of ideology and spreading it throughout the Islamic society, especially when it comes to the Muslim uh, uh, women. And one of my talks is, is some, similar to that, so I won't go into detail about that either. Okay, so why do we study this topic? The Muslim identity are talking about who am I? The importance of this is because the Muslim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants and the, the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him to be happy with us, it's a certain way. It's one way. It's not everybody chooses his own path. So we need to study this to know uh, how to, who, who are we. And also, the Muslim identity has been changing. And from here, if you live here in the West, the society, how it affects you as a Muslim. Or if you live in the East, like myself, that the, the afkar, the different ideas that come to the country and how it affects the Muslims in a negative way. So all of this, it's important to study this topic so we can hold on, inshallah, to our Muslim identity. The next question is, how can we rebuild the Muslim identity? It's been corrupted. And, and most of us have been corrupted in some way, either in a major way or a minor way or something in the middle. So how can we rebuild the Muslim Ummah and rebuild the Muslim identity? This is actually a very easy question. As Imam Malik said, Rahimahullah, that لا يصلح لآخر هذه الأمة إلا ما صلح به أولها That we will not be corrected or be, you know, be successful at the end of this Ummah except for what the, was successful at uh, the beginning of this Ummah. So when, if we're going to be successful, we must look at what made them so successful. And what was it? Was it some any magic thing they had, that they were magic? It was that they followed strictly the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Uh, 
And obviously those who came after the Sahaba on the understanding of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. So this is the way, inshallah, for us to return to this and to hold firmly to it if we're going to what? Correct the situation and to be uh, strong Muslims and have strong Muslim identities. Then the next question is, who is the real Muslim? Al-Muslim al-Haqiqi that we're talking about. Who is this, any, this mystery man, this mystery guy? We're talking about this, the real Muslim. The first thing, the first description of his uh, characteristic, characteristics is the sibra of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As it came in the verse, sibra Allah. And in the word Arabic, the word sibra, what does sibra mean? Does anybody know what the word sibra means? Sibra. I mean, you have a lot of Arabs here, they know what it is. I, mean, I can't see anybody, these lights are just killing my eyes. I mean, I have to get some sunglasses tomorrow or something. I, have, I just see some you know, faces, and these are really strong, mashallah. Uh, what does the sibra mean? Huh? Color, paint, something like that. Paint. You could say a paint or a dye. Sibra. Hey, the sibra of Allah, what does this mean? It's translated into what? The religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Deen Allah. But pay attention to, and this is the importance of learning Arabic, ayyuhal ikhwa. Because you never have a true understanding of the religion unless you know the language of the religion. Sibrat Allah, the paint of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because the true Muslim actually has been painted with the, with the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where he, he, we see this in his actions. Because Islam, what is Islam? Al-istislam lillah. Submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A Muslim submits into, into Allah and he is painted by the religion of Allah and all of his actions in his life. His aqidah, his belief, uh, it has been painted by this, by, this, uh, by this religion. The way he thinks, the way he talks, the way he walks, uh, his, his akhlaq, his morals, they're all from where? From, where? from this paint that he's been painted from the religion of Allah. So it's something shamless, something complete where we have been painted. So now, this is what we want for the real Muslim. If we're going to be real Muslims, we have to have this, this Islam where we have... Uh, submit it completely to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as somebody who has been painted completely also if we want to see any, how to do this how to be and implement this sibra in our life or this paint to be a, a complete Muslims as we mentioned the only way we can do this is to follow the Quran and to follow the sunnah of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the understanding of the sahaba and we'll find now all throughout the Muslim world, there's different jama'at and ahzab, different groups. Everybody saying that we are on the haqq. That we are on the haqq and what our, our way is the right way. Come with us. But obviously, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us, if we, and ikhtilafna fi shay, uh, that we turn, we turn it back to what? Who knows the verse? Allah wa Rasul. That we turn it back to, we go back to Allah and His Messenger. So that's the, that's the assess, that's the foundation we want. We go back to Allah and to His Messenger. Everybody says they follow Allah and His Messenger. So whose understanding do we go to? Who, best, who, 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 who are the best people to understand Islam? As sahaba radiallahu anhum. And also one of my upcoming lectures, which I think they changed the name of it, uh, it is, so we can be like them. And how so we can be like the sahaba. So I'm not going to go into detail on this, this point today, even though it's a very important point. We're talking about the different means in the, next, uh, in the upcoming lecture, I think it's tomorrow's lecture, of how we can be like the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And also, if you look at the hadith, pay attention to this hadith of the Prophet sallam, where he says, Wallahi laqajitukum biha bayda naqiyya. He swears by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And pay attention, it's also the strength, the quwa of the Arabic language. And you see these, what, what they call ta'kidat. When it comes to make any, put emphasis on something. And it, it shows you the strength and the beauty of the Arabic language. The Prophet he swears by Allah. Wallahi. To put emphasis on what he's about to tell you. And show you that he's not talking about something that's not important. He's talking about something that's very important. He swears by Allah in the beginning. Wallahi. And then he comes with another ta'kid. Laqad two, actually two. Laqad jitukum biha bayda naqiyya. As something white and pure. I'm talking about the religion of Islam. It's, it's, he's came to with, it, with a pure message. And then he, he even to emphasize even more. He came and he said, Wallahi, again. Lo kana akhi Musa. If my brother Musa was alive. That if you were to follow him, or if they were to follow him, meaning the Jews, and not follow me, that they would what, have gone astray, or you would go astray. So now it shows you uh, the importance of following the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, on purity if we're going to be successful. And we take from this hadith, first of all, that all the different manahij or ideologies or methodologies, that it won't be accepted from us unless it's what? Uh, purely on the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And also, 
that the pure religion, ad din al-khalis, the pure religion is only an al-ittiba' of following of the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also the wajub of following. It's compulsory to follow the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and nobody else. And that following other than him alayhi salatu wasalam is a form of dalal, of misguidance. Also, one of the things that helped the Muslim in his identity, and I have it here in my notes in front of me, is al-izza, which is what? Pride, or another word we use for it is what? Honor. Also, one of the lectures the brother shows for, for me is about honor. So I'll go into it briefly, because it's here in front of me as a second point. After the sibla of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Al-izza. Walillahi al-izza, walirasulihi walilmu'mineen. Ayabtaguna indahum al-izza, fa'inna al-izza talillahi jami'a. And the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked, أَيَبْتَغُونَ عِنْدَهُمُ الْعِزَّةِ I'm talking about the kuffar. Do they look as the Muslims do today? They look to the, the non-Muslims as a form of honor. And they want to see the way of the kuffar and they think they will find honor in this. And as it will come, inshallah, in the next coming lecture, uh, and as Allah made it clear at the end of this verse, فَإِنَّ الْعِزَّةَ لِلَّهِ جَمِيعًا That all of the honor, all of the pride is for who? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, when we talk, or we look throughout the, the, the history of mankind, and today we find that a lot of people, when they talk about Izza, they look at where they're from and who they're from, their tribes, uh, their nationalities. And as the Prophet wasallam said, da'uha finna mutina. And to leave it because it's something that is, that is afan, something that is what, uh, what was the word you would use in English? My English is not that good, by the way, because, you know, I... I, I, I and then and somebody told me an advice from Abu Osama, he had the same problem. You know, his wife, or his first wife anyway, was a Sudanese. So he, he learned Arabic the same way I did. So what he would do, if he forgot the word, they say he would just keep talking. You know, but I have a lot of brothers who know Arabic so they can translate for me. Huh? And it's, it's a, something of a bad smell, huh? Mutina. Something that smells, or rotten is the word I'm looking for, that's what it is. So rotten, and the Prophet said, leave it. You know, this, this, this type of, you know, this jahiliya. I'm from this tribe, and I'm from that tribe, so I'm better. And we see that all through mankind, they've looked at this as a type of pride, but it's never gotten mankind anywhere. I and mean, Hitler in the World War II, did it get him anywhere? Answer, Jamal. Hitler, was he successful in World War II? He wasn't at the end. And that's what he had this pride of, of his race, and that their blood was what? Blue. Huh? But it ended up turning being red like everybody else's, and he wasn't successful at the end. Also, a lot of people, it's important that we, put, we talk when we talk about Izza and having honor and our Muslim identity, is that Islam is not something that we hide. And this is very important now in the West. A lot of Muslims now, they're embarrassed to be Muslims. Uh, they want now to, to blend in, you know, uh, to, to shave off the beard and to look Western, as Western as possible, and to be like, you know, in the West. And, and, and you know, even some people don't even pray at work, you know, they wait till they come home. Yeah, you know, what, what will people say about us? You know, we don't want them to feel that we're different. And when this type of thing, this is what, we, this is what gives us the humiliation. And we do not get honor as Muslims. And I'll tell you an interesting story about this. I met a brother. Uh, if you tell me when the time is up, because I, I have no, uh, I don't know when, my, I can't see any clock or anything like that, you know. I'm going blind here, mashallah. So uh, I, have, I put my clock in front of me just so I wouldn't go over the limit that I have, but I, I can't even see it, so I'm honest with you. So. Uh, a brother from Saudi Arabia, he was taking a course in America. And he was, uh, he was an officer, I believe in the, in the police force, the army or what have you. So they had a blood drive or a blood bank. And, he, and it was from their thing that all of the officers had to what, contribute as a volunteer with the Red Cross. So this guy met him, and he's a, he's a regular Muslim, but he's, you know, he's Muslim, alhamdulillah. And he, you know, he, he prays and all, the, you know, all of that. Even though he, he, his practice might not be any mia mia, it's not 100%. But when he went into the, uh, the, the Red Cross, they said, you know, as a volunteer, if you just wear this shirt, his T-shirt. So he puts it on and he looks down and he has this big red cross on his chest, you know. And he's like, no, I'm sorry, I'm Muslim, I can't wear that. Uh, and then uh, the lady was so, she, was, she felt really embarrassed. She said, I didn't think about it, Mr. Muhammad, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't mean to do that, don't take it uh, personally. So she knew that this guy, he, you know, he had this izzah, he had this honor as a Muslim where he couldn't put a cross on his chest. After this, the, another person in, in the same course with him from the Egyptian army came, or the Egyptian police force. And he says to him, you know, this happened. He was like, Leh, ma kan telbis, ma fish haga, telbis. There's not, nothing wrong with it. You should have put it on. They're going to think, you know, we're, we have to tarruf, that we're extremists, and this, you're going to cause problems. 
And he should have just what wore it. And the guy was like, SubhanAllah, I'm a Muslim. How can I wear a big red cross on my chest? You know? So he comes in and she's like, I know you're not going to wear the t-shirt. He's like, no, give it to me. No, give it to me. I'm going to wear it. No problem. SubhanAllah. So this is not what we want. We Muslim to be clear. And SubhanAllah al when you do this as a Muslim, Wallahi, Thumma Wallahi, they respect you more. They might not like you. They might not agree with what you do. But they will respect you. Wallahi. And even yesterday when I came to the airport looking like this, they were like, oh my God, you know. But at the end of the day, they, they respected me. I told them, you know, what is it about? I'm a Muslim, this is what I believe. Alhamdulillah, they respected me at the end of the day. They might not you know, like it, but they respected me. Alhamdulillah. Even now I saw the women who go to the embassy. When I used to go to the embassy, you know, to get my kids' passport and have it in the West. When they come in, the Muslim, you know, they have their you know, hair out and all the makeup and this. And they used to treat them like dirt. SubhanAllah. They used to humiliate them at the embassy. They treat them really bad. But when a Muslim comes in, my wife would come in, full niqab, this. Even though they don't like that, obviously. But they do respect it. And this is what a lot of Muslims who are coming from the East to the West, or the Muslims who are living in the East, they don't realize about the non-Muslims. The non-Muslims respect somebody who stands up for what he believes in, even if they do not like it or believe in it themselves. And this is a reality. So, if we want to have a hold on to our Muslim identity, we must have this izzah, this honor within ourselves. Also, from the Muslim identity is holding on to the, tr- to the truth. Yani holding on to the haqq, even in the most difficult of situations. And we found before 9-11, a lot of Muslims in the West, they were serious about the religion. Uh, but when times started to get tough, we saw people, they started to change. They started to offer, even a lot of our brothers who were from our mashaykh and our, our du'at, who started to offer a watered-down version of Islam, not the, 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 you know, the true, pure Islam. They want to water it down and started making, you know, you have to come closer to them, make them think we're not like this. SubhanAllah, and you're a Muslim, what do you want them to think? You know, you're half Muslim and not in this, you know. You have to give them Islam, true Islam, if you want to gain respect from them. If you look throughout the history of Islam, and even before Islam, those, for example, Ashab al ukhdud look, look, look what these people went through for Islam. What they went through, because Islam, we talk about Islam, it's, it's the origin of all mankind, the, uh, meaning it's Islam lillah, to what, submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with tawheed. It is the origin of all the prophets. So if you look at the story of the boy and the king, and Ashab al khudud when they were burnt, why were they burnt? Illa yaqul mada? Huh? Qutil Ashab al khudud Who tell me the verses? Huh? Ah. Uh, after that. وما نقوم منه إلا أي يقولوا أي يؤمنوا. Okay. So now, why were they resented from these people? Because they would say, huh? And يقولوا they they would say that that their Lord is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and that's all they did. They say that they they that they're what. That the Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how many Muslims around the world have been killed in the world we live in today just because they said what? Huh? The same thing. And just because they want to implement it on the earth. Because they want to implement Sharia, their countries were invaded and they were killed and innocent people were killed in the path just because they want to say that their Lord is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala implemented in their lives. And if you look at the story also when the woman, she was throwing herself or, her, or with her child into the into the into this fire, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala from His hikmah, He made this what He made this baby talk, and He said, "Huh, asbir ya umma, fa inna ki al haq." To be patient, my mother, because verily, what you are on the truth. Also, if you look at the Sahaba in Mecca, what they went through for this for La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Also, after that, but look at the hardships they went through in Mecca when Bilal radiyallahu an was what? Placed on the hot sand. With a big boulder put on his chest. And he was allowed to say, Kalimat al-Kufr, but he refused to do it. Why? Because of this honor he had, and because he wanted to hold on to the truth, and not give in to them. Also, if you look at the shuhada, throughout the history of Islam, those who have died for Islam, have been willing to die for Islam. And this is something that no other religion in the world has. And a, a funny story about this, is one, one of the times when Sheikh Yusuf Esses, when he came, uh, to Medina, or maybe it was somewhere else in the kingdom where I, where I sat with him, he mentioned to us a story about when he first became Muslim. He was a new Muslim, and, 
he met this uh, this other an American man who was asking about Islam. And his first question was about jihad. He said, I want to know about jihad. And he was like, okay, jihad is, you know, it's a big thing. So he said, Let's, let me talk about it, the other type of jihad. You know, jihad, a nafs, the big jihad. You know, we, you fight against the shaitan, against this. And the guy was listening to him, okay. He said, you know, but that's not what I want. He said, these kids throwing the rocks in Palestine. He said, this is what I want, you know. He said, what is this? So the sheikh, he said, I had no way to say anything except for this is jihad. They're defending themselves. So they defend themselves, obviously. What they have is rocks. They don't have weapons. So they defend themselves what they have. This is jihad. Defending, defending the Muslim nation. So the guy was really impressed by this. He said, you mean that you will be willing to die for your religion? And the sheikh told him, yes, I would. I'd be willing to die for my religion. And he said, he said, I wish, he said, I, wish I had a religion that I, that, I, that I would be willing to die for. He said, I would not be willing to cross the street for my religion. SubhanAllah. Look at the difference between the Muslim and not Muslim. So this is one of the things that shows you throughout the history, those who have died, to hold on to this haqq, to hold on to this truth, to hold on to la ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. And you'll see this throughout the history of Islam. I want to mention also the du'at and the musliheen, uh, those who have called to Islam from, this, from the du'at, who have been through torture, who have been put in prison, who have been killed, uh, just for, so they could spread the message of la ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah, the true message. And I want to mention two examples of... Uh, two uh, of the du'at of Islam, who is the call to Islam. One of them was uh, Suleiman uh, ibn Abdullah ibn Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab, rahimahullah, on him, or rahmatullah, on him and his father and his grandfather. He has a famous book. Does anybody know his famous book? Huh? Yeah, it's the explanation of Kitab al Tawheed, but what's it called? The Fatih Majid is Sheikh Abdurrahman. The Fatih Majid is the is the what the, the abridged version of Taysir Al Aziz Al Hamid, which is the best explanation of the Kitab of Tawheed by Sheikh Suleiman. If you look at the books of Sheikh Suleiman, you'll see somebody who was a major, major scholar, and also he was one of the ones who was very shadid, very you know he he, he was he, he strived to be from those who would. Do al amr maruf and al al munkar. He would, and he called to that which is good and forbid that which is evil. And he hated that which is haram. So when the Turkish army, when they evaded the area of Najd and they captured them and they wanted to kill them, uh, before they executed Sheikh Suleiman, they came to him and they started to what, play music in front of him and do all sorts of other things that were haram to what? Just and, and he was, alhamdulillah, he stood very firm until they sprayed him, uh, rahimullah, with a machine gun. Until he was executed in that fashion, but just so they could what, and he stood firm in what he believed in. He, and he could have what, maybe asked for you know for this, and you know, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll be a good boy and stuff like this. And but he was very firm in what he believed in, and he stood firm until what, uh, he was executed. Another person, who is a very, I guess you know, uh, in, in, in this time anyway, somebody who was a bit controversial. But I want to, I don't want to talk about the person here. I want to talk about the stance, and that is Sayyid Qutb rahimullah. When he was uh, just told, all he has to do is, is go back and maybe you know praise the government a little bit, and uh, go back on some of the things he said. And you can imagine. I want you to you know, put yourself in that situation. You have been called into a certain message, and I, like I said, and a lot of people, oh, go say Kutub's dangerous guy. I know I'm not talking about the guy. I'm talking about the stance. Okay. Now, uh, this man, Rahimahullah, he was asked to to go back on a few things he said. Maybe praise the government a little bit, the Egyptian government, and they would let him go. Now he's about to be—they're about to hang him. Now think about this. I want you just to be in this situation. No, and even his sister came to him, and she's also in prison. Hamida, Rahim, I think she's passed away. If she's not, then Rahim Allah. Anyways, we say may Allah have mercy on the on the, on the living and dead from us. Um, she told him. She went to him, and she was like, you know, it's, it's not that bad. You know, maybe maybe staying alive is more important. But he refused, Rahim Allah, because he had something. He had a mabda. He had a principle that he believed in. And he said, all I've been calling to all my life, I could just what? I, it, it would go away from this. So he refused, and he was, he was hung for that. So you'll see now people who have strove for what they have believed in, and to hold on to the truth and to the message of Islam. And this man actually became more popular, what? After he was executed. And this is something that the non-Muslims don't understand, is they think you know, they, they can execute us, they can put us in prison. When they do that, we actually become heroes. Huh? Now somebody who has been killed for Islam, people want to read his books and see what he's about. So now, and also a lot of people, even though we don't agree with what happened in 9-11, a lot of people who became Muslims in the West, how did they become Muslims? 
They went read about Islam. These 19 guys, being there. they said, obviously did it in the name of Islam. So they want to know, what is this Islam? So they come and they, and they read about Islam. Oh, this is, this is, this is a good thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's the real thing. And this is why when we hold on to Islam, uh, and we implement our Islam in our lives, and we're firm on it, this will actually call the enemies of Islam, or those who do not believe in Islam as being the, the correct religion, they'll stop in the way and say, wait a minute. If what these people had was not haqq, it was not the truth, would they be willing to go through such hardships for their religion? Why are they holding on so strong to this, to all these difficulties? So they'll come to search and see what is this Islam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will open their hearts, and then they will become from those who used to fight Islam and go against Islam, into those who inshallah who enter Islam, and they will be from our brothers in Islam, bi-idhnillahi tabaraka wa ta'ala. After that, it's important as we hold on to the haq that we stay firm upon it. Because it's not significant, what's important is not just to know the haq and hold on to it at the beginning, it's to what constantly stay firm upon it. And we can see this, the importance of staying firm on the path and something we say as Muslims 17 times a day on the minimum. And the minimum or minimum 17 times a day. Now who can tell me the answer? إِهْدِنَا الصِّرَاطِ mustaqim. That we what? We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us to the straight path. And show the importance of what? And then staying firm on after that. This is the guidance to the path. And then staying firm upon it, how? صِرَاطِ الَّذِينَ الْأَمْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ And the path of, of those who have, who have rightfully guided from the, the Sahaba, رضي الله عنهم. We call to the, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make dua 17 times a day to stay firm upon that. Also, what was the dua the Prophet ﷺ used to always make? The most, as Umm Salama said in the hadith of Umm Salama, does anybody know? Yeah. And he's asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who controls the hearts of the men, to keep his heart firm on the religion. And obviously he's the Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has, has guided him. He has forgiven his past and future sins. And to this, he always makes dua with this. He teaches what? He teaches his ummah to what say, to, to say this dua. And this is a dua he used to say, uh, the most dua he would make, uh, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Also, uh, the dua of the salihin, Rabbana la tazil qulubana, ba'di the hadithina. Yeah, they ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to not what? Let their hearts go astray after they've been guided. And then after this, al-mujahada. Walladhina jahadu fina, la nahdi annuhum subulana. That those who are striving is the point. Those who strive for us, that verily will guide them to our ways. That if we want to be successful in holding on to our Muslim identity, then what? We must strive for it. It's not going to be easy. We must strive for it. And then at the end, what, uh, what did Allah SWT say at the, at the end of the ayah? In Allah la ma'al-muhsineen. Also look, that Allah SWT will be with us if we strive for Him. And He will make it easy for us. Also, those of you who understand Arabic, you see the beauty of this Arabic language. Yes, subhanAllah. The inna, the ta'kid. And then the lam. Al muhsini. Subhanallah. You'll see now the beauty of this Arabic Allah. And it confirms that He will, he will be with us and, and assisting us. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we strive for Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, if we look at some examples of this striving, striving for the religion of Islam. Look at Ibrahim. The story of Ibrahim and, and with, his, with his people. Look how he strove for La ilaha illallah. And look how that's why he's what the Imam of the Muhyiddin. And go back to the Quran. Now we ask you to go back to, and, and look at the story of Ibrahim and how he strove for La ilaha illallah. Also, as we mentioned before, or, and also Musa uh, with his people and our, our Prophet Muhammad with his people. How they, uh, what, 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 what they did to him in Mecca. And when he went to Taif. When they threw the rocks at him, they had their kids go out in the streets and throw rocks at him until he bled. He bled, uh, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and his sandals were, were, filled, were filled with blood. And you'll see now that he he continued to strive for Islam, and he didn't take it personal. It's another key point of this story of this qissa is that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, what did he say when they, when he was asked by the Malik al Jibal, the angel of the mountains, to what if he well, if they want him to close the two mountains on them and to what destroy them, what did the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say? What will we say now? If we had that choice, somebody had done something to us, somebody had their kids throw rocks at us, 
Well, we say, yeah, yeah. yeah cl- close it in. Ain't on them, ain't on, ain't on top of them. Destroy them, all of them. What is the Prophet saying? He said, لَعَلْ يَخْرُجْ مِنْ أَصْلَابِهِمْ مَنْ يَقُولْ لَا إِلَهَ إِنَّ اللَّهِ They perhaps something that will come from their offspring, from their children, he who will say, لَا إِلَهَ إِنَّ اللَّهِ Because the, the, our, our beloved Prophet ﷺ, he is the Ru'uf al-Rahim with what? His Ummah alayhi salatu was salam. Also, as we mentioned before, how the Sahaba, how they strove for this religion and the scholars of Islam after they came after them. And we talk about the striving. The maratib are the levels of striving for Islam. There are four. Awal shay, first of all, is al-ilm. And this is something that was mentioned, maybe everybody knows, those who study the usul al the origin is there. But, this is something Ibn al-Qayyim, rahimahullah, said before that, and this is where it was taken from the, from the, from the statement of Ibn al-Qayyim. And this is something that's in Surah al-Asr anyways, this foundation. And that's why Imam al-Shafi'i mentioned the importance of this. And if, and if, it was, if only Allah sent down this surah to, his, to, to, to us, it would have been sufficient. Uh, the first thing is al-ilm, that we learn as Muslims. When we talk about striving, is that we learn our religion. And unfortunately, a lot of Muslims today, they've turned away from learning their religion. And, and we find a, a great ignorance of the, in the Muslim ummah about their religion. And after we learn, we must what? What's the next step? Now after the after the ilm. How was that? Al-amal. That we act upon it. We implement it into our lives. Because Islam is not something we say on our tongues. It's something to implement. It's more about actions. We implement our lives. And after somebody has learned and implemented his life, the next step is what? A dawili. That he calls to it. That he calls to what? He calls to this. He calls to this knowledge. He calls to the Islam. <coughs> because somebody who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed to know the beauty of Islam and to have knowledge of Islam and then to implement Islam in his life, he finds the halawa of iman. He finds the sweetness of iman and this calls him to what? Want to call other people to Islam. And that takes us to the fourth step, which is what? As-sabru ala al-adhafi. Subhanallah. Because anybody who calls to this way is going to be what? Tested. To see if he's truthful or not. He's going to be tested to see is what he's, is he, is what he's calling to, if he is true in it or not. And this is the way of all the salihin, all the pious, the pious believers in Islam and the, the people who have followed Islam, implement Islam and call to Islam that they have been tested. And anybody who, who, who wants to what? Do that, he knows and this is what we say, you know, part of the game. If you're gonna be if you're going to be from the du'at, then you're going to be you're going to be tested. May Allah make us strong when we are tested during this. The next thing is that uh, in the Muslim identity that we must strive to what purify our souls and to find this this piece of this piece of, of, of heart in ourselves. Because this effect when we are peaceful inside ourselves this has an effect on, our, on us, first of all, in holding on to our Islam and to our Muslim identity. And secondly, it affects the others who see us. Now people realize that now, if you look at, and in the West, uh, how many psychiatrists do, you, psychiatrists do you have in the West? I, mean, I don't know about Canada, but I'm assuming you know, you're not too far away from America. That the, what the, 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 I read some of the uh, statistics in America that maybe a half or more of the you know, American people, they have mental problems. Why? Because they're looking through the pleasures of the dunya in the wrong place. And we have the cure, subhanAllah, in Islam. But unfortunately, a lot of us, we don't implement it, we don't take advantage of it. Let's look at the cure. And how, how do we... Because stri- a- anybody in the world is striving to find what? Happiness. Peace of heart. Now, when the people go out to the clubs and they... Uh, they, they boogie or whatever they do, you know, and they get drunk and, and high and whatever. What are they looking for? They're looking for happiness. When they fornicate and they do all this, and, and you know, they want to be happy. Now, when, when, the, when the Western woman, she stands two hours in the mirror in the morning before she goes out, and she, you know, puts on all these uh, different clothes, she says, you know, she wants to be happy. She wants to feel good. All these people, people who want to gain all the money, they're looking for happiness. But do they find it through this way? Do they find it or not? No, they don't. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ Look at the Qur'an. Everything is in it. Everything we need. It's right there. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ That whoever turns away from my rumors, he will live a difficult life or a miserable life. And this is the life, unfortunately, that the non-Muslims live. Because they're looking for something and they're not finding it through that. 
Even the, 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 the fact, the simple fact that a Muslim knows why he was created. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِعْبُدُونَ تمام. So now, a Muslim knows why he was created. Does, a, does the non-Muslim know why he was created? Huh? He doesn't. And that's why, I don't think I sweat in Toronto, man. It's kind of cold here, but mashallah, these lights, mashallah. Huh? That uh, uh, the Muslim, he, when, he knows why he's created. He's able to what? Deal with the hardships of the dunya. Also the iman with what? Al-Qadr. Look how it affects us. Through in the Muslim community, whether in the East or even here, what is the suicide rate that we have? Do, do we have suicide rate? As the, if every now and then you have somebody who might kill himself, maybe. Maybe, I'm saying it's there. But, as the ulama of usul say, the scholars of usul, that al shad la hukma lahu. Something that shad, something that's rare, we don't even give it a, a, a ruling. We don't even look at it. Because it's very rare to find in our societies. However, if you look in the Western societies, what are their suicide rates? It's major, major, big time. And, and, and I don't know about here in Canada, if you look in Europe, for example, or even in America, it's, it's crazy the suicide rates you'll find there. Why? Because they don't know why they were created. They're looking for happiness in the wrong place, and the only way out at the end is to what? Is to kill himself. In Jamaica, when Bob Marley died, what did they do? They went up to the buildings and threw themselves off the buildings because there's no life without Bob. Uh-huh. So this now we see the difference of, of the Islam, and because we, we know. I mentioned that when I tell the people in Sudan, when I give lectures there, and when I talk about this issue, that if we were to bring the Westerners to Sudan, I'm not talking about the people who, who, who have, you know, they come like the UN and what have you, they have a certain uh, nationality where any time they can leave. I'm not someone who comes and can't leave, like the Sudanese, they have to stay there. I say, what do you think they would do? Could they take it in Sudan? I say, that I think if, if the Westerners were to move to Sudan, I think all of them would commit suicide, the majority of them. Because life there is rough, it's difficult. But in Sudan, we have no suicide rate. The people, because they know, it's a certain amount of time. It's dunya, he's being tested. It's from the ibtilaat of the dunya. He's patient at the end. You know, alhamdulillah, inshallah. Hopefully it's off to Jannah, inshallah, uh, at the end. So it's just, he, this is something different between us. We know we're here for a test. We're here for a short period of time. And our focus is what? In the akhirah. Also, <coughs> when you look for the, the, what do you call it, the peace of heart, and you look to, for this, it, it, it's through what? Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inu al Through the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through implementing the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through reading the Quran, we'll find this, but through all the other ways, we'll not find it. So if we want to hold on to our Muslim identity, we have to have, uh, and reflect on these points in our lives. And we know why we're created, we know what we're here for. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, look at these verses. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتُ وَالْحَيَاةَ Why? لِبُكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنَ عَمَلًا Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the one who created life and death. Why? So He can test you to see which one of you is, is what? Best in His deeds. So a Muslim knows this. He's here to be tested and to see what He's going to do and who is the best in deeds. Also, uh, if you look at this hadith, in this hadith, as somebody who, I'm a speaker, now when I go places, sometimes, you know, I, I pray in a certain masjid, and I find myself, I have to get up and, and talk in Sudan. And obviously, it's in Arabic. So this hadith, it saved me several times. It's the hadith of the Prophet, where he says, Ajaban li amr al-mu'min. And he said something, and he, the, 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 the strangest of the, of the affair of the believer. فَإِنَّ أَمْرُهُ كُلُّهُ خَيْرٌ That all of his what? Anything that happens to a believer is what? Is, is good, it's khair. That if he is what he's, he's if he's uh, afflicted with something, he's he, he's patient. Sabr fakana khairan lahu. That he's patient, so it's good for him. And if he's given something that's good, he what shakar that he thanks Allah subhanahu wa taala for, it, so it was good for him. And this is only for the believer, as it came in the hadith of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I'll tell you two funny stories about this. The first time that I went to uh, when I left Medina and came back to Sudan, I had fasted outside of Sudan for thirteen years, one in Kuwait and about twelve in Saudi Arabia. So, even though it's hotter there in the, in the Gulf, it is, uh, you know, with the air conditions, you don't really feel like you're fasting. And that's why one of my friends, his grandmother, she's very old, you know, and she's a, she doesn't really know much about Islam. But she was there with her daughter in Saudi Arabia, and she fasted the whole month of Ramadan there. And as soon as she came back in, like, uh, and, oh, I think it was after Hajj or in Shawal or something like that, she came back to Sudan. And when she came back, she started to fast every day. So the people were like, Hajj, why, why are you fasting? When you, <laughs> she said, I'm fasting Ramadan. 
And she, they said, you fasted Ramadan in, in Saudi Arabia, didn't you? She was like, yeah, but that's not a real fast. Because all my life, she's been in, she said, she's been in Sudan where it's very hot and it's very difficult. That was too easy. That's not a real fast. She said, I'm going to redo my fast again. You know, she was ignorant. Obviously, it was accepted. But she wanted the real fast where she can feel it in Sudan. So you feel the fast in Sudan. It's, it's very, very difficult. Believe me. You know. So during this year, uh, I, didn't get, I, got any, I put a request into the, the, people, the brothers who I was working with at the time to get an air conditioned. I just, I just come and I didn't have uh, the ability to buy one. So I got the okay from the, from the uh, administration. But I didn't get the money until the 29th of Ramadan. So <laughs> even though I bought it, it didn't really do any good because it was at the end of Ramadan. So, uh, and, and, and the electricity just kept cutting off during these days. You know, no AC. And then the electricity cuts off and it's just so hot and you're so thirsty. It was so difficult. You know, and then I went to pray with one of the Mashaykh, Juma, a brother picked me up and he said, why don't we go to Sheikh so and so and pray with him? I said, yeah, that's cool. I never prayed there. And I kept getting phone calls to give talks there. And I said, no way. I can't do it. I'm going to die, you know. So I go to the masjid, and in the second khutbah, he's on the minbar, and he says, Alhamdulillah, today we have our brother in Islam, al Akhil Fadl, so and so, 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 uh, coming from America. So the dars we have, the lesson we have after Jum- the, the Jum'ah khutbah today is going to be for him. And I was just like, wow. You know, I just didn't, I didn't know where to hide. And this is something I couldn't get out of, obviously. You know, I'm, oh, he's on the minbar, you know. So I have to get up, and I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. You know? So I thought, as I was laying in my room the other day, that... Uh, I thought about this hadith, Ajab al Yaman Mu'min. And I started to look, you know, what is good in being in the middle of Ramadan, all this heat, no electricity, the water cut off. I said, where's the good in this? And alhamdulillah, I was able to any, benefit about 40 different benefits. I'm just sitting back thinking about this hadith. So this was my talk. And it was, they, they liked it. It was very interesting because there's a lot of things actually you can benefit. You might think, oh, wow, you can't benefit anything from that. But you can. Also, another time, at the beginning of this Ramadan, uh, one of our mashaykh, uh, who is the, the leader of the mosque where I'm at, he's the imam, and he's the one who always gives all the lessons. And, you know, we do our thing on the side to help out, but he's the, he's the main man. Unfortunately, he's been sick uh, during his la- these last few months. May Allah cure him. Uh, and he's been back and forth to, to Holland uh, and to Germany and to try, trying to and he, uh, look for a cure. And unfortunately, he hasn't found it yet. So he's very sick. So he, he shouldn't even have been in the masjid on the first night of, uh, of Tarawih. He came in and he said, tonight the kerima between the four rakats, the, the, the talk, it's yours. So I said, oh man, you know what I talk about? You know, I didn't have anything on, on my head. And then we come to pray. And alhamdulillah, they, they added on four air conditions during Ramadan. We didn't have enough air conditioning. And on the first day, the ones we had, even though it wasn't enough, nine of them weren't working. So we're just in, in you know, this, uh, this sweat, sweat, sweat. And it's just so difficult, you know. So... Once again, this hadith saved me. You know, as I'm walking up, what am I talking about? I say, oh, there's some benefits in this. Like I said, when we sweat like this and we're standing like this, we think about what? Yom al-Qiyamah. We're going to be standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our deeds. So this hadith was, was a way out for me once again. And I was able to give a short talk about that, about reminding ourselves about any, the ni'mah of the things of the dunya that we didn't have tonight. And then also about what that great day when we stand in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we'll be covered and our sweat by the bad deeds that we used to do in this dunya. However bad they were, the sweat will keep coming up until some of us will eventually almost drown from the sweat because of the bad deeds on that great day. May Allah protect us all from that. After that, we must, if we're going to hold on to our, our Muslim identity, realize the reality of this, li- of, our, of this life. And we mentioned several things about that. And this is also something that separates the Muslim from the non-Muslim, as we mentioned, is that we know why we're here. We know why we're here and what we're trying to do and where we're trying to go. And this helps us hold on to our Muslim identity. And then last but not least, that we must be from those who constantly return to the haqq, to the truth. When we want to hold on to our Muslim identity. And this can be in, in two main ways. If somebody has fallen into something that's innovation, something that's not from the sunnah, and he learns this, he must immediately what? Really mean what? Huh? Repent and go back to the sunnah. If, he, if he's made bid'ah in the religion, he's innovated something in the religion, he must immediately what? Return to the sunnah once he learns this. And subhanAllah, I met some brothers recently and I found that they were what? Uh, following a certain school or a madhab in fiqh. And they were following, you know, even the things that are weak in, the, in this madhab, they were implementing it. I was like, man, you know, that's really, that's deep, you know. So I know, I know we become Muslim, we want to follow the Qur'an and Sunnah, and they were new Muslims. So I asked them, we were debating this, I said, so now you're going to tell me that if you find a hadith 
which goes against what you what you learned in his madhab, you won't take from the hadith. He's like, no, who are we, brother, to what's the imam's statement? And I says, the hadith is clear, the Prophet ﷺ says this. And these imams, they tell you that you must take from the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They say, who are we to understand the hadith? We must be humble. And they say, subhanAllah, billah. Now if you find something that's not against, it's not authentic, that you have been doing as a Muslim, something that's gone against the sunnah, you must immediately repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and follow the sunnah. And also, repenting from what? And going back to the truth and what? The sins. Uh, do we sin as Muslims? Huh? No, Abe, hey, how can you sin? All of us sin. The Prophet ﷺ said, كُلُّ بَنِي آدَمْ وَخَيْرُ الْخَطَّائِينَ التَّوَابُونَ and all of the children have made mistakes, but the best of those who make mistakes are those who what? Those who what? To uh, Abu, those who repent. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, He said that He loves a tawabin. Also, once again, the Arabic language, ayyuhal ikhwah, the importance. I went with some of the brothers, and I don't want to, you know, ruin the brothers' sales in the, in the bookstores. But I went with the brothers the other night. We saw everything there's in English now, and I said this is a good thing in a way, but in another way, it's a very bad thing. Because when everything's in English, people get what? Lazy and they don't want to learn Arabic. And you'll never understand Islam properly if you don't know Arabic. And it was something all throughout the history of Islam that anybody, any Muslim, had what? Had Arabic. All throughout the world. Now in China, if you go to some areas, you'll find, you know, and they have tombstones, and tombstones obviously is not from Islam, but just to give an example, on their tombstones, it's all written in Arabic. What does that show you? What does it show you? What do we gain from that? They knew Arabic. They knew Arabic. Also, from the uh, transcripts, the maqtuta that we have in America and some universities from the slaves who were stolen from their land, written in which language? Arabic. Also shows you that the Muslims knew Arabic. And all the Muslims around the world used to know Arabic before the colonization came and forced them to learn French and English and what have you. And um, you'll find that all throughout the world, this is the situation where Muslims knew Arabic. So you must know Arabic. at tawabin He didn't say at any at taibin at tawabin What does at tawabin mean? Those who constantly what? Fall into sin, but they what? They repent. Subhanallah. And also in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet Sallallahu said that... Uh, Wallahi idha lam tudnibu la dhahab Allahu bikum that if you do not repent, or if you do not make sins, then Allah would and he get rid of us and come with what? People who make sins, and then they ask for His forgiveness, and He forgives them. Because through us seeking the repentance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the tawbah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we see the implementation of the tawheed of the asma and sifat, where we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through His names and His attributes. And we see that He is the Rahim, the Ghafoor, the Kareem, the Wadud. Huh? Uh, he's the one, Aladhi Yuhib al Afu, as it came in the Hadith. Huh? And Ramadan, as you all know, the Hadith of Aisha. So we see this, this the beauty of these names, and these attributes, and the implementation through our acts of worship when we call and we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala constantly from our sins. And I'm going to end with a verse where it shows you the reality of this. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاهِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسُهُمْ Those who have done that which is immoral, or they have what? Oppressed themselves. How they oppress themselves? By what? By sinning. And doing that which is, they have not been ordered, and what have you. Shortcomings. What, have they, what do they do? What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? Pay attention. ذَكَرَ Allah. They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as they're making this sin. This is the first thing. And uh, the second thing, ذَكَرَ Allah, فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا لِذَنُوبِهِمْ SubhanAllah. They immediately remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They sin. All of us sin. None of us are perfect. Those you see, mashallah, who are practicing Islam, even Islam, they have sins. But the difference is what, when you make that sin, you remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You remember the day of judgment. You remember you're going to be held accountable. You remember you're going to be, you're going to see these sins on the scale, on the day of judgment. And then, you remember Allah and then what? Repent for your sins. And then pay attention to the beauty of the Quran. In the, in the middle of this, Allah reminds us about the importance of Tawheed. Uh, the importance of Tawheed, and He says, It's from the Lil Ta'if in Tawheed, where Allah says, 
who forgives the sins other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Reminding us, our hearts should only be attached to who? To Allah. And we only return and repent to who? To Allah. We don't need to go to the grave of some pious person, like some ignorant uh, do it, ignorant people do in Muslim nations. Or as the Christians do when they go to the, the, the priest for confession. We go straight to Allah. And Allah reminds us of this when He says, well, may a little bit of Allah. These people, they have nothing. They can do nothing for us. And the only person who can do something for us is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then pay attention to the third point. Huh? And this is what's important. They do not continue to do that which they have done. All of us are going to fall, have shortcomings and fall into sin. But we're, and he, what's important is that we not continue on this. وَلَمْ يُصِّرُوا عَلَى مَا That we do not continue to do this. We stop there. So that's three points. First of all, that they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then that they what? Uh, ask or seek for His forgiveness. And they do not continue uh, to fall into that sin or continue to do that sin. They leave it immediately and make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This, uh, inshallah, is what I want to remind myself and my brothers of. When the keys of holding on to our Muslim identity and saying, uh, who am I as a Muslim? And these, these things, inshallah, will help us uh, holding on to our Muslim identity and being strong in our Islam. And Allahu alam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad.